All right, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for your patience while we kick this off and let people kind of filter in here, but I am super excited to be joined by three founders today. Um, we're gonna talk about co-founders. So first, who are these people and where we're coming from? My name is uh, Ryan Nash, I'm from Gust, I'm CEO of Gust. Um, this is part of our uh, grow stage programming that we're doing with our founder curriculum. Um, so if you've been paying attention to emails, probably from me, we're doing dozens of events leading up into the summer, all about kind of the post-launch, you know, building traction growth stage of a company, whether you're bootstrapping yourself or you got an early friends and family kind of pre-seed round. At some point, you have to put, you know, the time and the money to work to build your company, to get to the next milestone. And one of the things we hear from our audience all the time something that people really struggle with, especially if they're a solo founder, is augmenting the team in the early days from that very important co-founder role. Now, not every single company needs to have a co-founder. You can go on the internet and find contradicting statistics all over the place of like, well, companies with more than one founder have a success criteria of, you know, X more than this, or companies, you know, with three are like this, but four is worse, or like never start a company with your sibling or never do it with your partner. But in reality, co-founder relationships are probably one of the most important relationships and one of the most difficult to nail. And there's been a lot of people out in the space in the time that have tried to build co-founder dating apps that have tried to like capture this special sauce of bringing a handful of individuals together to like make something actually work. Um, nobody's been able to do it at a scale that they can just like uh, golden goose produce companies that have perfect co-founder relationships. Um, and often as we go through the community and talk to people, we find that the stories behind finding your co-founder are incredibly based in serendipity. There are things you can do, there are actions you can take in order to increase the chances of finding that special someone who's going to kind of be your work you know, partner for a long period of time. Um, but depending on your company, depending on yourself, depending on your background, the variance is huge. So rather than try to just have an educational whatever, here's like some practical steps to go find a co-founder, good luck. We wanted to bring in real stories from real founders um, to actually say like what they went through um, and the, pos the positives and the negatives, the ups and downs, and get some real information on how it works. Um, and so I am joined by three founders, uh, possibly all repeat founders and, you know, founders from different backgrounds. But we have Gil Silverman, um, who's been a longtime guest contributor. Uh, he's a lawyer. I'll actually let everybody introduce themselves themselves because that's they're better they know themselves better than i do uh but we also have sam rodriguez and alan mcgee i've had the pleasure of working with alan directly in a past life past startup um as well as working with gil you know day to day even and gust and sam is actually i believe the neighbor of one of our uh employees is that right correct kellen pal yeah. close friend and uh former neighbor and we're coming from hawaii from new jersey from pittsburgh from georgia so we're covering a lot of the states um, but I'm going to kick this off. I'm going to let each um, person introduce kind of their startup and, you know, the journey so far. And then we're going to get into some kind of like moderated Q&A and please ask questions. So I see the chat's already lighting up. q and is lighting up. I will find spots when people ask, you know, questions if we do them live, if we do them later. Most of this is going to be informal dialogue, and I'm sure we'll have a lot of a good audience response there, too. So without further ado, in order of the punctual, Alan, do you want to kick us off with your your background and your current startup kind of story? We're going to keep these to like five to seven minutes-ish, so it doesn't have to be super thorough. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Um, so it's been a, a little bit since I've been a, a, a actual founder, but um, I'm a mechanical engineer by education. Um, I moved into software on the consulting side for a few years, and I went nonprofit for a few years. Um, and then eventually left to start my own startup with a member of the board um, from the nonprofit I was working at at the time. Uh, this is 2012. Um, Congress passed something called the Jobs Act. It was going to change the way that early stage investing happened. It was very exciting. Uh, we, we, uh, I, I uh, had two other co-founders. Um, when we started, eventually we had a third co-founder. So there's four of us in total. Um, uh, some stories about the, the quantity there as well. But I think um when we started it we were really because it was kind of tied up in some regulatory decisions in a waiting period and we started a uh effectively an equity management company cap table company and it was called sharewave and um three years later we were still a cap table company and we were acquired by a company called gust which is how uh you find uh, me here and i work with 
Ryan and, and Gil for, for a couple of years while I was at Gust um, and uh, got to integrate the, the software, the, the equity management software into different parts of Gust, including into Gust Launch. Um, and uh, since then, I, I, um, I went and uh, worked at another startup, um, always early stage and always on the software side in my career. Um, and so I decided that I wanted to do something that was a bit closer to um, bridging the gap between atoms and bits. Um, so uh, software where it um, has an application in the real world. So now I'm head of product at a logistics company, um, Series B logistics company. I joined them, I think, as employee six or seven um, when, uh, when we could all um, sit around a table. And we're about 70 people now. We have about 14 locations across the country. It's called Saltbox. Um, and it's a, uh, uh, we build software for SMBs who are, um, e-commerce merchants. Um, so yeah, lots to share about kind of the journey that I very quickly skipped through those, that three year period prior to Gust, um, but excited to, to share stories with you all. Awesome. Thank you, Alan. And now I can't remember who came first, Sam or Gil, who beat us there. Was it you, Sam? Gil. Gil. All right. Gil, kick us off. Gil, Gil pick one of your founder experiences. <laughs> Well, I may go through a few, but you have already stolen my thunder about all the wisdom I was going to impart. So I'll just go uh, straight to the stories, except one, which is that about 10 years ago, I made a vow, I, a pledge that I would not compare uh, startup tech companies to warfare, sports, uh, sex and romance, or the Wild West. And I'm going to break that today because uh, a co-founder relationship is one of two voluntary relationships where you choose another human being uh, that you're going to be with long term in a bilateral relationship where you're just going to go through everything, heaven and hell together. I mean, and I, I promise you will go through struggles. There's not a single company that doesn't have struggles. So this has to be someone who you trust to be in the boat with you as you go over the waterfall. So um, the other thing is that like starting that kind of relationship, uh, some people are very meticulous and they make a list. They try dating, which doesn't work, you know, the formal approach, but they go sequentially in a systematic way to find their founders and other people meet their life partner or business partner at a bar or, or a church picnic or something like that. And I'm in the latter category, but I would argue that either way, the, the list of what makes a good co-founder, the decision process is the same. And it really does come down to uh, what I call guided serendipity. Um, Okay, so <laughs> we'll get more time to dig into those, but tell us about, I know you have a handful of uh, companies you've been in. Uh, okay, quickly. Well, yes, I, uh, second year of law school, like other good students at top universities, I landed a in summer internship at a major firm. The idea is that if you do okay, and it's a good match, which it usually is, they'll offer you a job, and then you begin your grueling uh, lockstep process of going through the ranks of junior associate and eventually 10 years later making partner, and maybe five years after that, uh, becoming an equity partner who's a co-owner of the firm. So that's the peak of the profession, is, as long as you don't burn out or get drummed out or not have the skills. So uh, I show up at the office and the receptionist shows me to my, my office, which is a nice office, and that's it. There's no form to sign, there's no um, employment agreement, there's no handbook, there's no orientation, no greeting, I'm just sitting there. Uh, a few hours later, someone comes in, pokes his head in and says, oh, you must be the new, the new intern. That doesn't go anywhere either. Uh, so I'm just left to my own devices and I wander around the office asking everyone what they're doing, if they need any help. And so I'm cruising along, you know, getting, but then about two weeks into it, let me pull up my screen. In walks this guy, Brent. Um, this is a contemporary picture. So imagine a 30-year-old younger version without the tattoos, but with bleached blonde spiky hair that's black at the roots. And he is a larger than life character. He's boisterous. He's charismatic. He is always on the phone with current clients, potential clients, past clients, and potential past and future girlfriends and business partners. He's, I'm kind of sucked into his life because he's living this. He, he fills the room. And um, initially I was kind of off put and, and shrinking away, but then we started realizing we had similar interests and he is smart as heck and 
very creative and thoughtful. So he and I were talking about the meaning of life and more specifically about what the law, the role of law in society. We had uh, uh, visions for our own visions for what became Gus Launch, not that that's what started Gus Launch, but we were thinking about the same issues about how you could automate the law. Okay. Uh, and, and by the way, the, the firm um, was so successful that within three years, we were both mid-level partners at the same large law firm. So we had gone about 15 years into our career in three years because he called me up after we both declined our offers or he quit his job to join a startup. He said, you know, um, let's start a law firm. This thing, the internet, uh, it's going to be big. It's going to change the world. We can be a part of it. You have no idea. And, and you know, I took that opportunity. Second one, I'll pick up the pace a little bit. This was a business I started with my lovely and talented spouse. Uh, pointer here, if your co-founder does not like to have their name or picture on the internet, you can use a cartoon avatar. But uh, contra to uh, what Ryan just said, do not start a restaurant with your spouse. Just don't. Don't start a restaurant and don't start any business with your spouse. Uh, parents and children can work, mentor, mentee, siblings can work. Uh, spouses, that, that would be an hour-long presentation of time. <laughs> the restaurant did pretty well. We were around for 17 years, had sister restaurants. We were the talk of the town. Uh, so some things did go right. Uh, third and final example, um, I actually did meet so Sohel at a bar, but not just any bar. This was the after party for Y Combinator Winter Demo 2013. I think it was winter last um, and I didn't actually meet him, but my business partner did, my uh, law firm's business manager. And uh, we roped him in as a client. And about um, some time later, he was, uh, we, I helped him start fund and make some investments. And he comes to me and sits on my red couch, uh, which is actually my spouse's red couch, but it was in the office. And he says, I have this project I'm thinking about. Uh, what do you think? And it, the idea of the project is that he's going to take people who have millions of dollars of stock in unicorn billion dollar companies, but can't sell it because of the transfer restrictions and the investors don't want it to, to do that. And we have buyers who want to buy in, but they aren't connected in Silicon Valley and their check size isn't big enough. Can it work? And I said, I think it can. Uh, as We'd we just have to do some financial legal engineering and uh, I sure hope you have a lawyer on staff because you can't afford me. You can't afford anyone who's qualified enough. So uh, do you have any co-founder? And he looked at me and said, you. So he kind of chose me. I didn't choose him. Uh, and by the way, he was 20 years old and I was 46 at the time. So the half your age plus seven rule, you can break that with co-founders. But, but you do have to have some parity and level of respect and trust. And this guy is and was a rock star. So uh, one of the things is when you have these opportunities, when serendipity strikes, you have to be ready for it. Well, I don't have enough time, but I did mention that when you do have co-founders, whether it's serendipity or hunches or something, you have to have the right, um, there goes my uh, alarm, you have to have the right um, qualifications. They have to be a good founder to be a good co-founder. So they have to be someone who's capable of running a company or doing their role. Plus, the relationship matters have to work. Um, not just everyone who's qualified is going to be right for you. And the situational, they have to be able and ready, financially able to do it. So this rules out 99.9% .9 of all potential co-founders. And that is, unlike most people say 99.9, .9, that's not an exaggeration. Probably one in a million people on this planet is your ideal co-founder, uh, if that. Uh, but part of serendipity, key to serendipity, key to being at the right place at the right time is show up at the right place at the right time. So for example, uh, uh, not just any bar, but an after party to a tech event, not just any entertainment, but this seminar, I would guess that about one out of every hundred people watching this seminar is your potential co-founder if you don't have one already. So if that's the case, uh, mingle, meet each other, and then learn how if you do business together. Final point, Almost every successful co-founder, I've seen hundreds of co-founder relationships, the successful ones have worked together before, whether that's at a company or a client versus a professional or a customer and vendor, they have seen what makes each other the tick and they're comfortable with the relationship and they know they date before they jump in, essentially. So that's all I can say. <laughs> these are the factors. Do yourself a favor. Do a screen cap. I will put these in time. 
So, um, that, but, we'll but these, are, these are the factors you should evaluate against all the people who may be your potential co-founder. And that's all I have to say. All right. So this is fantastic, actually, because I think what we're sitting at is three different people in very different stages of startups. Gil, can you stop sharing your screen? Yes. Um, Sam, I believe you are in it at the moment, knowing uh, your travel schedule. So Alan's coming off of a previous startup and an exit. Gil is, I think, mostly spending time in angel investing areas, like after these three different companies and efforts. And Sam, I believe you are living it day to day. So I apologize that somebody with a slide deck got to go before you. I should have put you in between. Should have seized that opportunity. But Sam, give us some background on your company and where you're at right now. Certainly. So a little bit of my background. Um, since I was a kid, I've wanted to be in business. That's the only thing I knew. I used to wear little blazers. You see me in one today. Um, but even as a kid, I knew that I wanted to be in business. So when I graduated college, uh, that's when I started my first business. I'm a five-time serial entrepreneur. I've had three successful exits. And currently, I'm working on a very disruptive business in the financial planning space, wealth management space, and currently am a co-founder in uh, three businesses under that massive umbrella uh, as of 2023. So quite a bit going on there. Um, I've been in many different industries. My first company was in um, energy efficient design, tax savings, government funding all around 2007 and the you know boom of green energy lead development. Um, and that eventually took me down a product road, which expanded what we were doing in that space. Um, I eventually left that business. I had a co-founder in it. Um, and that co-founder was a person of perceived necessity. And that's how I describe it. That relationship was something I thought I needed, something I thought was going to take my business to the next level and ultimately learned a lot of lessons through that. After I left that company, um, I ended up going and starting a legal support firm uh, in Texas. And it ended up getting, I wouldn't call it acquired, but we got merged into the largest player in the space within about six months and you know, transitioned out right away. Uh, was there for just a short period of time. But that took me to really when my entrepreneurial career really took off. I started a company called Borrow Time Watch Company. We were in the luxury watch space. It was a men's membership across the U.S. Um, it was all when collaborative consumption was really coming on board. You saw companies like Rent the Runway and others really taking hold in New York. Uh, we had a great run for three years, three and a half years, and then we got acquired by 11 James out of New York, which ultimately ended up going under, but uh, it was a good win. And in that company, I had a co-founder of Convenience, someone that I was very close with, a good friend. We shared a hobby and an interest. We both had capacity. We both had dollars to you know, put to work. And it didn't end well for our personal relationship, uh, but the company wasn't a loss or a failure by any means. I took a couple of years off after that, got into financial services, which is what my background is. I'm a finance guy by trade. I've always been in the markets, wealth management, financial planning area. And that took me to a fintech startup um, with a really good friend of mine, former college friend. We were fraternity brothers. We'd known each other for many years. And that was really a co-founder of intellectual value capacity for me. We saw the world very similarly. We thought very much in the same way. We saw opportunities the same way. We tapped problems very similarly. And so it was what felt like a really solid alignment. Our company, Tip Yourself, uh, we had it up and running from 2015 to 2019. We were acquired out of a big fund out of California, uh, but our relationship did not end well either. <laughs> but the business did. The business was highly successful. And a lot of that I attribute to the learning lessons from the four previous startups that led me to Tip Yourself in my relationship with Mike Lenz. Um, today, though, I'm in a very different spot. I have co-founders around me where we share values and a belief system. Our values of what we do, how we see ourselves adding value to the world, and what our beliefs are around some of the problems affecting our industry is what's kept us so aligned. As Gil said, I've worked with the gentleman that I'm partnered with now over the last 10 years in many different capacities, so we have seen each other grow. We've seen each other. We understand what makes each other tick, as Gil said, very important. Um, but there's no 
really arrange marriages that work in this business, right? And when you think about co-founder, I think there's a lot to unpack. We oftentimes jump in thinking we are missing or lacking something of value in our business. And I need to go out and grab a co-founder to bring it to life. But if you think about a co-founder, really, from my perspective, there's a title aspect to it. There's compensation tied to it. There's responsibilities. There's ownership within the business. There's vesting. And then there's intangible value that these people represent. And so I think oftentimes entrepreneurs think I need a co-founder with a capital C and they give too much of the business away or they rush into arrangements just to find out they maybe didn't need as much as they thought. And there's ways to bring over co-founders with a little C where it might not just be the title. It may not just be equity, but you can really exchange value and build a business that's highly successful, regardless of what happens between the dynamics of either person. And I think that's something that's really important to young entrepreneurs to realize you may have co-founders that end up being lifelong friends like I have today, where I know we're in business together and, and nothing's going to turn us away from each other. But you may also have co-founders where the relationship may sour, but your business is highly successful. Those are not ne necessarily, in my perspective, negatives. It's a very significant positive if you understand how to structure your deals appropriately and you can get the value out of the people you need around you in order to build a very successful business. Well, you guys really took away my need to ask questions and highlight information about the principles around a co-founder, but I think there's a ton of cool stuff to dig into here. And Alan, I feel like we didn't actually give you enough opportunity to talk about your, your co-founder experience with ShareWave. So being with uh, the Gil's position and Sam's position and Gil and Sam, thank you very much for, you're already leading with the insights um, about this and we'll start to assemble them into some takeaways in the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Uh, but Alan, if you want to jump into kind of the story of your co-founders, the story of the beginning of that, and how you actually met them and assembled that team, um, we can add it in the context with the other guys' stuff. Yeah, very quickly, the um, we worked together on a project for six months and felt like, uh, I didn't know, by the way, I was living in New York City and very, um, since 2000. Uh, uh, 12. So it was very connected with the startup community in New York City and surrounded by it. But um, so I felt like, well, I I'd love to participate in a more active way. And I was working on a project for about six months um, at an agency and uh, working directly with who became my co-founders. Um, and so we thought, well, we have six months together and we know each other well enough and, and we get along. And so um, and we have uh, skill sets that are uh, complementary to one another, and so um, this feels right. But um, I was I was completely new to early stage and and really starting a company at all, and so um, uh, I didn't really know uh, what what um, both Gil and Sam have shared. None of that was available to me, and finding you know at the time others who had been through it, I, I didn't have access to that, and so. Um, it just felt like uh, a, a bet that I was willing to take at the time. And so, um, yeah, I think throughout that process, I think a lot of what I, um, when I reflect back on that, I used to think a lot of it was you know, a bit more science than art and trying to find, you know, who's a good fit based off of background, skill set, education, experience, um, all the way down to like how we were trying to split equity and trying to be as mathematical as possible. And um, and now uh, it's, it's been some time since that moment, but um, it is much more on the artistic side. Um, I believe a, a lot more about getting like to, to what's kind of already been said, deeply understanding uh, both yourself and why you want to start something. Like, um, I didn't at the time I wanted to start a company. That's not a good reason to start a company. <laughs> wanted to start a company. Um, and and you realize, you know, when you're in the middle of that um, and, and times are hard, you have to love that company because um, you, you can't walk away. And so uh, I didn't know that. And so um, but I had different reasons for starting uh, or, or choosing to begin a company than my co-founders did. We never talked about it. And so um, we had, we were at different moments in our life and um, one of them eventually left and, and the other one eventually kind of began to phase out. And so I felt uh, kind of on my own, kind of carrying this thing and trying to move forward. It was very lonely and isolating. And so um, 
it was really just not knowing who I, I love my co-founders and I, I still have uh, good relationships with them, but I, I, it wasn't the right way to begin a business. So um, there's a lot, lot within that I could unpack, but that's a bit more of the story. So there's a common thread between everything that you guys talked about, Sam, with your experience and like success with business, but this relationship isn't good anymore. Um, so it sounds like, you know, there's two sides. Uh, well, there's more than two sides, but you have that skill set, that complementary thing, like what the business needs. And then there's also that value match. Um, before, uh, I'll throw this to Gil, actually. Um, are both absolutely essential or is one more important than the other? Uh, between what? Could you refresh my... Uh, so skill set, you know, and being able to do what the business needs that, you know, say the other founder or founders just cannot do, you know, if you're a non-technical founder or whatnot. And then value match, where it's like what Sam was saying is like finding a team that actually, or having the conversation that Alan alluded to that they skipped about like, why are you in this? Why are you starting a company? Do you feel, it sounds like the ideal scenario is you get both. You get somebody who completely fills in your skill set gaps and matches your value so that you can run. But do you feel like one's more important than the other? They're both 100% important. So it's like asking whether the roof or the walls are more important than a house. You have to have both. <laughs> Uh, the, the caveat is that um, not everyone at the startup has to be skilled. Someone has to be skilled. Um, you have to fill the skills. But one person could specialize in leadership and vision and be the CEO. That person may not actually be have the chops uh, to do what the technical thing is. But every box has to be checked as far as what this startup needs. Um, technical skills are typically one of them because outsourcing those usually doesn't work. Uh, if, if outsourcing worked, then you have the skills because you rented them or bought them. There, there are other skills like uh, you know being good with numbers and accounting that ought to be in-house, but if not, you, can, you could punt and do your best until you have enough money, you can bring someone on salary. But otherwise, yeah. you have to have all the necessary skills to run uh, because most startups fail anyway. But there are a number of things where this will definitely kill your startup. So not having the skills to make your product or to sell it, there's no way that the startup can succeed. So you have to have that. Uh, yeah, but, but certainly you have to have the chemistry between the founders and the alignment of goals and working together and so on. Uh, because otherwise you could have a great product and the, the company itself is just not going to work. Do you mind yeah, if I so add something to that, Ryan? Sure, go ahead, Sam. I was going to ask you actually. <laughs> yeah, I... I think it's important to realize the technical is easy to measure early on. The values piece is something you learn as you kind of go through the business process with people. You can try to have that conversation on the front end, but I would imagine Gil and Alan would both acknowledge until you're kind of in the heat of the battle with someone where there are some tough discussions, tough decisions to be made, the values may not always be as apparent as you may think. And, and I think that is something that you kind of learn as you go through this. But values are fundamentally acted rather than spoken. You know, if oh your actions match up with your words, good on you. But really, it, it is how people handle themselves in situations that are not easy and pleasant and polite and things like that. Um, That's one of many reasons why co-founders work better if they have gone through that before. Uh, ideally in another startup or, or just another division of a company. Uh, but but actually running a company together, uh, no matter how stressful anyone tells you, it is more stressful than that. You will go through all kinds of things. Um, you know, I, I, I could list them, but uh, that would be another discussion too. Uh, and so, you know, you sign up. It's like you sign up for this beautiful cruise or something, and then you go into a hurricane together and to see how you are, uh, you know, when your company is about to fail. And it's up to you to use your wits uh, without actually knowing where you're going to save your company. And I, the reason I wanted to lean into the one question about skills versus values mesh is I think a lot of times, and I especially see this from non-technical founders, people are looking for like the, the unicorn person that's like, oh, the technical skill set that I don't have. Like this vision is, is just one developer away from blowing up in the market or all I need is that person that can raise funds because I'm, you know, a quiet genius and I could build anything. And in reality, like Gil said, in the beginning of the startup, all the hats are still there. The CEO, the marketing hat, the developer hat, the, you know, public relations hat. It's just, if you're only one person, they're all on your head. So you'll have to send a marketing email when you, when you start to expand your team, you know, those skill sets, sometimes depending on the nature of the business, the industry, 
you don't necessarily need to be a world-class marketer in order to engage in marketing for your startup, but there is usually some, you know, key to the, the actual DNA of the startup, like Gil said, that you have to have an expertise in. Otherwise, you know, why would your company be more successful? Uh, I want to pull out and something that was kind of connected in all of your answers recently and this idea of working with, you know, somebody beforehand in some other capacity. So you could trial by fire, you know, in terms of, you know, start with a start a startup with a person that is is new to it. But Alan, you mentioned you had a about a six month project with two co-founders unrelated to the startup that you started, but that kind of got you guys thinking that maybe we're a founding team. Um, yeah. does, oh, uh, does anybody have any idea of like, is there a minimum? Is there a, you know, is it six months? Was that the, the smallest possible thing? Is it like you should really know a person a year, maybe working at a bigger company, you know, going through anything? Does anybody have thoughts on kind of like how long until you have those experiences that actually forge, you know, that kind of relationship and expose the values through actions rather than just through words? You can start out. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think, or, or the way I would, I haven't started another company since, but I've been part of a few others that were incredibly early stage. and. Um, so I have a, I'm, I'm very kind of tuned in to, um, making sure that other co-founders who I'm surrounded by have al already gone through this process of trying to understand each other. And it's very hard to say, you know, to, me to measure something in time and say that there's some magical amount of time that will make sure you've de-risked whether or not this co-founder is a good fit for you or not. Um, I think it's more about. Uh, but where I've seen it be successful is rooted more in values, um, like Sam has mentioned. I think there's like, figuring out how you can be especially vulnerable with somebody about, um, you know, not just your values, but also like it is a big thing, it's a very difficult thing to start a company. It's you're, like we've talked about, you'll face a lot of headwinds, um, being open about your fears and being open about the things that um, are maybe in your personal life that might make you unavailable in moments of time and and kind of how to keep your time uh sacred so that you have balance and those are the kinds of conversations that at like a deeper personal level that i have seen be incredibly effective at weathering the storm when you're going through the hard moments um and so i don't think it's time-based i think it helps to just get more experiences with somebody that that's certainly uh, I would take that over no time at all, um, but I don't think there's a formula that would indicate what that looks like. I think uh, what we were working on a project that was, like looking back on it, nowhere near as difficult as what we faced when we were building a company together. So if there's any way to um, figure out how to get into the depths of um, uh, like understanding values and practice, then I would I would try to to, to spend more time in those places. Uh, great. And Sam, did you have any additional thoughts on that? I saw you nodding away. Um, you know, my most successful venture to date was Tip Yourself. And my co-founder and I, we went to college together, uh, fraternity brothers, as I mentioned before. And we had been separated professionally for about eight years before we started Tip Yourself. And we would get together at a bar in Chicago on a Saturday at noon every week for about six months until this idea came up. And we weren't trying to start a business. We were talking about big problems and how you might solve them. And every week we would have these intellectual dialogues and then we would go back and spend our week. You know, he worked at Sapient Nitro, which is a massive company on the marketing engineering technical side. Um, I was at a Fortune 100 finance company at the time. And so we would go back to our worlds and do our own thing until we decided that helping people save money was a problem worth fixing. And that every solution that had put, been put forth so far uh, wasn't hitting the mark. And there was a lot of behavioral psychology that came into how you would approach that problem. And we just got excited, right? Pure excitement drove us to starting the business. And I think the value prop that was there was the fact that we both shared a belief that this was a problem we're solving. The tiny difference was that you know, I still wanted to stay in financial services and he really wanted to stay on the marketing technical side of building more applications. That's not a negative thing. Um, it was very positive for us to go our separate ways. And again, the business was successful. But today, some of the guys I'm doing business with, I've known for 10 years in financial 
wealth management and planning. They all have a different strength. They are an expert in one area. I'm an expert in a different area. We complement each other extremely well. Some of the guys we've known for two years. And so to Alan's point, I don't know that there's a right time frame or a minimum, but I do know as, you know, someone that's been doing this for a while, I know when I click with the right personalities, I know when I feel like the core values are similar. And I think that you just get a natural instinct as to, yes, I want to do business with the person. I wouldn't rush that to, you need to be my co-founder. There's a lot of ways to engage people that are a great fit that can help you propel your business forward without it always being default. They are my co-founder. They are my co-founder. They are my co-founder. And right. sometimes I think that gets lost on young entrepreneurs. It's a rush to make a decision to check the box almost. I need this. I checked it. I can move forward. And oftentimes that's that's some, sometimes it'll bite you in the butt, right? I was always told it's preferred not to make chicken salad out of chicken shit. <laughs> and and that is that is something that I think about often when it comes to business in general. All right. I've never heard that one before. Um, and this is interesting, too, because if we have a lot of people who like, you know, uh, the demographics in the Gus ecosystem are like entirely across the spectrum. So I wouldn't say we're weighted in towards a young entrepreneurs or old entrepreneurs, or anything like that. I think we pretty much capture the spectrum. But both of the points that you're making into what Gil said is like, even if you're at the early stages of your career and you want to start a business and you're you're unsure of what that is, but that thing's in your path, a lot of these lessons can be acted on even today, even if you're not ready to jump into a startup. It's like, think about like that eight year, you know, difference is a great example. The My first professional job, I still have people that come into my orbit after going off and doing their whole thing for six years, doing another company, joining a big thing, starting a family. And then those conversations, that interest, that authentic conversation between few people is like, hey, wait a second. Is there is there something that we would, would we both do this? Um, Gil, before I move on, did you have any uh, commentary on the, you know, working with somebody leading up to it, if there's some feeling of minimum, I mean, you can always just jump into it. You know, you just, you're increasing your risks, but maybe a rule of thumb. I think it's a matter of quality time, not amount of time. Um, back to the relationships and dating. I used to think to myself, you never know if someone's right until you've been uh, stuck in a snowstorm with them. Um, and uh, we don't have snowstorms here in Hawaii, at least not on this island. Uh, so I'd have to be stuck in something else. But, you know, there's um, going through a life-changing transformational experience, like having your company almost fail or, you know, having the, uh, you know, the police launch an investigation or, you know, one of my companies had a shooting, you know, stuff like that. Uh, when you're right next to someone, you bond pretty quickly and you can tell quickly whether, you know, you're, you're both meant for each other. Uh, so when times are good and you're saying, oh, we're going to make a lot of money, we're going to change the world, this is going to be great. That's part of it. You have to align, you have to agree. Uh, but but going through the experience of something that really knocks you out of your normal zone and then coping with it together uh, it is very important. Or Or maybe just the pressure of completing a big project together, you know, launching a product within a big Fortune 500 company. And uh, you work with someone. So, you know, the, the founders of Yelp, uh, that's an example of a great co-founder team uh, with a, one rock star on it, Jeremy. Um, they had, uh, they had one had been the other's boss at PayPal. So, uh, you know, they were early in PayPal. So that kind of relationship. I, I don't think it really matters the duration, although, you know, more, more time helps because you've had more of a chance to see each other you know, when you're in a good mood, bad mood, uh, and so on. But, um, you know, my example with Sohail, my last example, um, though we had known each other for probably almost a year, sort of, indirectly, uh, we had probably only spent about three hours, uh, you know, of actual face-to-face -face time before we started talking about Ford. But we had gone through, you know, tasks and projects together. Um, you know, he was about to invest in this company, Zenefits, and organize his fund, and we got everything done. And the paperwork wasn't dry. So why don't you just invest right now? We can just fold that into the fund. We can do whatever we want. His LP backed out. So now he has this money and no fund or something like that. He's his investment. So 
So we kind of worked through it. So we had this experience of kind of seeing how each other reacts uh, creatively to a bad situation and makes the most of it. So, you know. Yeah, I like that separation of quality time. And it's like, if you can't, if you can't create your own crisis, um, which I have seen some founding teams do, uh, maybe not for, you know, to forge the bonds of co-foundership in the, in the crisis, but, uh, you know, those quality time, I guess I'd like to run around and think of what you all think about accelerators, because accelerators actually seem like a, a certain kind of accelerator, an accelerator with a demo day, with like a clear, you know, path to produce results and whatnot, is kind of putting artificial constraints on a startup, you know, with a timeline on it. Um, do you, any of you have experience with that? And you do you think that is actually sort of a good way to trial by fire co-founders, especially if the relationship's fresh? I'll kick it off with you, Alan, and we can just go around. Um, I don't, I don't actually have any experience with accelerators, so I'll, I'll pass it to Gil and to Sam. Uh, let's hit up Sam first, and then we'll go to Gil. Uh, one of our projects ended up doing a summer stint with Tech Stars in Chicago. Um, so very familiar with that space. Um, but we we already knew each other. What I would tell you is programs like that tend to test you in a couple ways. They test you around work ethic, right? How many hours, how much commitment are you putting in? How easily do you get burned out? You start to learn that about people and programs that are structured that way. Um, resiliency. I think that's something that, that is very important in business, right? How fast can you rebound from a loss or a negative um, downturn or a contract that goes sideways or maybe a, a supplier that stops supplying or a vendor that stops paying, right? I, th I think how resilient you are in business and how resilient you are through situations tells you a lot. And I learned a lot about my co-founder through that program in those two ways. And that was extremely valuable for us. Oh, very cool. Uh, how about you, Gil? I actually never asked you if you have, I know you have accelerated experience on the investor side. Oh, yeah, I, I was actually one of the legal people helping to design one of the first accelerators. Uh, but um, accelerators didn't really work and had a bad reputation until Y Combinator. Um, now, I don't know what the stats are, but I have a feeling that going through an accelerator is helpful. Um, the, their program sure teaches you a lot. And, you know, the only way to learn how to run a company is to run a company. You know, you have to be in business. You have to learn it for yourself. Everyone will tell you that. The accelerator combines the education and the tasks with actually running a company that's in the accelerator. So I, I think it does what it, the, the top 10 ones anyway, the you know, ones like Plug and Play and Alchemist and Y Combinator and 500 Startups and the rest of the top Tech 10 stars. or 12. Uh, tech stars for sure. Uh, I don't want to leave anyone out. I'll hear about it. But um, I, I think they do a good job of imparting knowledge and, and raising the uh, profile and success of their companies. Um, I don't know what the stats are. But uh, I think you already have to have your co-founder before you come in. It's harder to add a co-founder later. By the way, adding co-founders gets harder and harder, or successfully adding co-founders is harder and harder. Um, the farther you go, because you've already launched the company and now someone's coming in. Um, so I think the uh, accelerator could be a trial by fire of whether you made the right choice and you may decide not to work together. So you may lose a co-founder or abandon the company during or after. Um, one thing that Brian Zisk, uh, who's attending, he's an old friend and client of mine, um, he does mention it's a lot easier to hire a co-founder than to fire one. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so you probably ought to make some good choices early on uh, and, and then see how it goes. And you know, if it's not working out, probably you do need to part ways. You should go into it with the plan that it's not going to work. That's something that uh, the legal team around me advised after a couple of successes and failures. And um, I truly believe the reason Tip Yourself was so successful as a company was because we spent extra time on the beginning putting in protocols that ensured, regardless of what happened between any of us that were involved, the business was always going to be protected and the business would be able to grow and sustain. And we saw that play out. We didn't want to ever have to default to some of those agreements we had all signed, but I'm really glad we did because again, highly successful for all of us involved. Um, and again, just a way to protect yourself. I don't ever go into something thinking it's going to fail. 
but I'm also smart enough to know that I need to be prepared for the worst day so that I can excel on any day other than that. And if the plan's already baked in, then I'm good. I don't have to think about this down the road because that's a situation you never want to find yourself in. And I did in my first two, and it was very difficult to try to unwind something and it gets extremely messy. Yeah, honestly, not being able to imagine failure makes failure hit a lot harder. But if you can actually say like, the chances are low, I'm not a cynic, I'm still optimistic, but at least I'm not naive about what failure could creep up on me. And you actually highlighted something that I think will be our last structure disc question for the, the whole panel. And then we'll get into some of these great Q&A things is ownership. Um, so I think you can all answer this is like at some point you have to decide who owns what percentage of this company that you're starting together. And this gets murky if you know you started it and you brought somebody in six months later. Um, but I would be very curious to hear your both experiences and lessons learned on the, the very weighty conversation around splitting equity. Uh, do you want to kick us off, Alan? Yeah, I don't I I think and when I did this and I mentioned we were very mathematical about it, and experience was kind of the leading factor that drove the the higher percentage. The irony is I, I we were building what we thought was um going to be a marketplace for early stage investing, and we built a cap table company. So I over the three year duration I was running it, saw over 500 cap tables and the good and the bad within within all of that. And um, and so uh, there's a lot of different ways I think this happens. Um, what I've seen, I've also been a part of enough early stage moments where um, there's a chance you're going to get it wrong and that will come back up later. It might, you might not know how important that was or how you might have felt, you know, I left this moment where we decided on this and it was a good decision, but I feel like I'm working more and it's been a couple of years now. And so th those things don't leave you. Um, so I, I don't know how much others would agree with me, but I've seen the best outcomes from uh, my network where it's as close to just being fair as possible or, or uh, as close to a, 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 an even split, just because, and that comes with one caveat, which is that um, I think about the word obsession a lot with co-founders and you have to be uh, willing to wear any of those hats and figure out when to fire yourself from wearing a particular hat because of a hire that came in. Um, but you have to be so obsessed with what you're trying to um, kind of create into the into the world and, and the vision that you have that you're willing to do it at all in order to make that come to life. And so if you find someone who is obsessed, the experience I found over time uh, is a little bit less of um, of an important variable in that calculation than it was just to find somebody who was willing to do anything in order to make this thing successful. So um, that 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 I know is not how a lot of others see it. Um, but I have I have come to over time after I was so confident in how mathematical and precise we were and what we came up with, um, realizing that that was wrong when I was the last co-founder standing. Um, <laughs> that, 28.72% uh, uh, ownership prior hmm. to that. <laughs> you know the number? <laughs> um, yeah. It, uh, so anyways, I think, uh, you know, a lot of things change over time. So I found um, I found that to be true, um, at least in my experiences. And I will beat the drum of good vesting schedules help protect companies uh, if those yeah. decisions turned out to be inaccurate in the early days. Um, just for talking time, Gil, do you want to give a perspective on splitting ownership? And then we'll get to Sam and then we'll get to some of these questions. Sure. Um, don't be afraid of 50-50. That's how I, I've always done it. Um, my philosophy is we don't know enough already. We're both going to, or 30-30-30, whatever it is, uh, we're all going to devote our lives to it. Uh, and we're going to shine or not in ways that are unforeseen right now. Uh, don't, be a, don't be fooled by that whole thing like someone has to have the tie-winning vote because if someone says, no, I know you don't agree with me, but we're going to do it because I have one more share than you do, uh, that's not any way to make a decision. Um, at the founding stage, decisions are made through consensus by leadership and conviction and persuasion, not by force, because that is not any kind of relationship the founder should have. Now, that said, I did not have 50% of Forge when I started, but that's because Sohail and, and our third uh, Co-founder Sunvit were clearly the leaders of the company, and I was not a uh, hundred percent fully committed at the time because I was still running a law practice. But it was fair; we didn't go into micromanaging it. Um, 
CEO is always going to end up with the lion's share of equity anyway. If you don't know how that works, <laughs> you, you, need, you, you can uh, help CEOs deviously increase their equity share over time. Uh, that's a story in itself. But as the company goes through successive rounds of financing and eventually goes public, there are additional grants that get made, particularly to a CEO. So they'll end up with more equity, however you get it, uh, most of the time anyway. All right, how about you, Sam? Uh, I'm a big believer that fair does not mean equal, okay? And and so um, I've had relationships where we really use three parts of the equity component to build out what we're after, right? There's equity in the business, obviously. There is board and strategic partner uh, where you can earn equity depending on how you're involved in the company, especially if you step away for your vesting schedules on everything we do. Um, and more importantly, I think there's equity that you set aside for future hires. Um, and that equity can be even earned by founders if they take on more responsibilities or additional roles. And so uh, most of the businesses I've been a part of were not 50-50 relationships, unlike Alan and Gil. Um, there was some sort of split based upon, you know, idea, who is going to be fundraising, who's running day to day. Um, so it wasn't as scientific or mathematical as Alan. It wasn't as general as Gil. Um, but it was a blend of the two, knowing that there were different ways that we could incentivize people, and there were different ways you could protect against someone feeling as if they weren't being recognized for their contributions. Yeah, I, I should add that if one partner or one of the co-founders is clearly bringing more to the table um, in terms of uh, reputation, ha having already developed a business, credentials, what have you, uh, skills, uh, then yes, I, I, but I, I generally would keep those numbers pretty broad, like, okay, then it's 60-40 or 70-30. Now that said, uh, whether you say you're saving room or you're just adding on top, yes, you'll add employees and others, and those numbers will have a lot of decimal points and numbers. They, they won't look like even numbers. But as for the initial split between the founding team, I, I think eyeballing it is often the best you can do. Yeah, and that's, I will have to bring up the Gus perspective on this. Alan and I were actually working together at the same time that this tool was built. Um, like Alan said, we we had tons of cap tables over the years. So we aggregated data to build a tool to actually look at, you know, what goes into the early stage of the company. So I threw it into chat, but this is like an interactive survey tool that has helps you have the conversation. And I actually think the conversation is more important than the actual numbers that come out of it. You know, if you're starting a new venture with somebody and you're not thinking holistically about everything that it takes and there were some questions in the Q&A, which I'll kill with this, but is like, oftentimes people coming to the, the table might overinflate um, their industry or their expertise and not understand all the facets that it takes to make a startup successful. So you'll often see somebody like with an engineering background being like, well, if I don't build it, it doesn't exist. So I must be at least, you know, equal shareholder. But if you walk through the survey and you find out like, oh, you're taking a salary, even though diminished, or you're not putting your own money into it, or you're not working full time yet, or you don't have, you know, experience that is key to raising money or key to understanding the problem domain, often your skills are much more commoditized and could be paid for on the open market. It's less of a, you know, do or die skill set that the company needs to it just exist. So we send this tool to anybody who's struggling with that conversation because you can fill it out as the CEO or founder. You can have all your co-founders or potential co-founders fill it out. And it really just starts good conversation amongst that founding team, especially if they haven't found that happen naturally. Um, and it might actually get to some of that values exposure, you know, what you think of as your role in this company as you're jumping into it. And I never recommend 50-50. So sorry, Alan and Gil. <laughs> There's a ton of recorded stuff in me and YouTube that's always like, do not just say 50-50, both directors and run with it. Um, but let's get to some of these questions here. Um, do, 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 do. Oh, well, this is actually super related. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, how should we approach bringing in a co-founder that has certain skills versus just planning on hiring it uh, once the company has funding? I'm not going to go around the table. Anybody who feels the most strongly about this, uh, feel free to chime in and, or then I'll call names. I think you have to unpack what you're after, right? Again, I, I go back to six areas, right? There's the title and some people are after the title or they want to be acknowledged as a co-founder. There's compensation, whether that's direct or indirect, responsibility and ownership within the business, your vesting, and then lastly, your intangible value that you bring to the table. Everyone's motivated by something different. And so sometimes 
we say co-founder and they're really excited and they think, man, I'm a co-owner and that's enough to motivate them. It doesn't matter what their share is. There's others that we call co-founders that end up really acting like employees. So I think before you just jump to this idea that we need this or the solution is just going out to the market, the candidate that you're trying to attract, the talent that you're after, whatever their motivators are, if they believe in your vision and what you're trying to do and they want to see it moved forward, they will invest time and energy. You need to find a way to properly compensate them for that. And that co-founder, I think, sometimes gets used too frequently where we just call them that. And I, I've seen that play out. There's a company in Chicago, two founders together, started the business, got off and running very successfully. One left his job, one stayed at his employment. There was a separation of the business. And then the co-founder that stayed started to hire co-founder after co-founder after co-founder. And what he found was that as he was out there trying to raise capital, he had to keep explaining why the co-founder seat had been filled and vacated four different times, right? You do not want to be sitting across from an investor trying to explain why you made a faulty decision four different times when you're asking them to write a check to you. Doesn't build a lot of confidence. And so I think you really have to unpack what you're after and what the candidate's going to need in order to be motivated to add the most value to what you're doing. Just my perspective. And founding team member and co-founder are often used too interchangeably. And I think like what Gil was talking about with Suhel, it's like that seemed like a, we are going after this together, shared values, full steam ahead, no matter what. While other people are like, I want to be on the founding team of a startup because I want like some upside and I'm ready to work hard. But that could be a very different person. Um, somewhat related in terms of identifying the kind of person. We have an interesting question um, uh, in the Q&A about bring out a CTO. Um, trying to get a co-founder's agreement in for the CTO, and they want to put the vesting schedule based on milestones on product quality and when it was shipped. Uh, anybody have any thoughts on putting milestones-based vesting instead of time-based vesting into a co-founder relationship? Don't do it. <laughs> um, and by the way, I'm not your lawyer when I say not to do something. <laughs> None of this is legal uh, advice. This is just <laughs> my gut reaction. Don't do it. Um, if someone's working out, they're working out. If they're not working out, they should leave. So not hitting your milestones is failure. But hitting your milestones and getting into an argument about whether you technically got that, that's a problem. That's always a problem. Because what is your milestone? Let's say it's to release the product and get 10,000 users. You know, that people come up with any, I can promise you, anything you come up with is probably the wrong milestone. Because you will say, no, we're, we're actually an enterprise product. We're going to make two sales. Then you go to your technical co-founder and say, hey, ha, ha, you didn't get 10,000 users. No, no equity for you. Um, so someone has to make that decision. It's not like you can write this code and your software is going to say, oh, you hit the milestone. You have to um, go to that milestone and someone has to decide. And that's a very awkward conversation if, if one person is really the founder who's deciding whether their co-founder deserves to get the equity they've been promised. I just don't think that works. The, the standard vesting schedule already covers that because it's either perform or quit. That's how it should be. Um, and maybe as to the question, you know, what if someone goes above and beyond or becomes more important? Maybe you can handle that with a supplemental equity grant down the road. So almost anything you can put in a co-founder agreement has already been thought of hundreds of years ago when people were designing what a corporation is. You have stockholders who have stock agreements, you have employment, employment agreements. That whole suite of documents subsumes almost pretty much anything you can put in a co-founder agreement. Co-founder agreements are most useful before you start, when you're not ready, as almost maybe even not enforceable, just a memorandum of what you're planning. And that is very useful the co you know, to, to work through all these issues. Yes, we're going to have an office. Yes, we're going to expect people to come into the office. Yes, we expect it to be full-time with no side projects. Yes or no. Or what, what are we going to do? Um, and sometimes it's very useful to put that in paper and sign it and put it in writing. And maybe even say, when we do, when we do incorporate a company, it's going to be 62% and 38% or 50-50, however it turns out. There's a, uh, there's a thing out there called the Founders Accord from, I believe, the McCormick Law Firm, which intends to do exactly that. It's a pre-incorporation document that's really like, hey, if this thing starts to work, we're going to do all these things and kind of set expectations and things like that. I think you're familiar with that, aren't you, Gil? 
Yes, a useful exercise, not necessary, because I tell people, look, if you're ready to go, let's let's get going. Let's incorporate the company yeah. and get started. Uh, and not just, you know, go around in circles talking about what we're going to do. But yes, it, the, the, that is uh, useful. It's a good document. Especially if people, and this was another question we kind of hit, if you have life situations where it's like, hey, I want to like finish out this thing, you're talking about it, or what Sam brought up and is you're, you're catching up with somebody and it starts to feel like something could be there, there, but you're not immediately tomorrow. Oh, look at that. We got some bell. Um, does anybody have to hop or do we have room for uh, a bit more questions? I will totally respect your time if yeah. you need to hop. Gil's good. Sam's good. good. You Alan should know better with attending meetings with me. Uh, <laughs> so thank you very much on that one, Gil. Um, this is really a couple of questions in the chat, both from Aaron and Jed that I wanted to kind of jump into is this idea of not having a co-founder. Is there situations where you would actually recommend not having a co-founder? And also, if you don't have a co-founder yet, um, it seems like there's a lot of friction getting investment accelerators or anything like that. Uh, what are some options to, to help ease that friction? But we'll start with, can anybody think of a situation where you don't want a co-founder? I know Gil's got something, but we're giving Alan and Sam the opportunity. I mean, I've, I've seen, I, I know many successful founders who don't have co-founders, but it, like it's, it, that's a tough, broad question to answer. Like there are very specific solutions you might be working on where you've got a blend of uh, kind of everything where you give comfort to an investor who's making sure you're kind of de-risking the things they're looking at. Um, but if it's not there, then um, you know when you get to that first round of funding, there's going to be questions, and you might want, feel the need to kind of balance out the founding team so that there is um, more control over risk. So um, it's very situational, but I, I have I don't think it's always required, um, and it's also very personal. Like you are you the kind of person who is very comfortable going it alone, and you might be. Um, uh, I know, like for me, I went from being like I mentioned in a group to being alone. And so um, I really wish when times were hard that I had someone, you know, by my side um, because it gets that, you know, the lonely at the top phrase is true. Like you, you are trying to uh, go through these things and you, you, you want to make sure that you have employees and you're thinking about your culture and you want to make sure that in tough moments that you're not having a retention issue. And so it's a lot that you need to just communicate with somebody who gets it. And, um, and so I think, you know, I'm the kind of person who would love to have a co-founder if I built another business. Um, but there are people who would prefer to be to be on their own. There's, there's no no correct path. I would just add to that. I think it's important to look at the strength of your bench, right? If you think about a sports analogy, if you're the only player on the court, but you have a phenomenal team right next to you that can support you as being the only player on the court, you and many times can still win, like Alan just said. But there are times where you don't want to be a lone wolf out there and the solo practitioner, and it, it is extremely valuable to have your gaps or um, other areas of interest taken care of by a specialist that you can count on. And so it, it really depends on what team you have around you. From my perspective, I personally wouldn't start a business as a solo practitioner now. I just I think that what I've learned in my you know, 15 year journey has led me to wanting to be part of a group. I really value that. And I like being around people that can challenge me, hold me accountable in different ways than just an investor can. Um, and it helps propel me forward. And I think I add that same value back to the people that I'm around. So I find a lot of comfort in it, as Alan said, because it is lonely. And this is already hard enough. <laughs> like, like being an entrepreneur is an extremely tough, trying situation. It is. You grow a lot. It is also amazingly fun and adventurous. And you will learn a lot about yourself and increase your strengths and learn some weaknesses. I don't want to <laughs> be on that journey by myself. I love having team around me. So it's important now. Yeah, I can't believe I can make a sports illusion right now, but I believe Stephen Curry scored 50 points last night or the night before, but his team also scored 70 in order to win that victory. And that 50 alone wouldn't have been enough. I know nothing else about basketball, Robert, if you're in the audience, I'm sorry. You nailed it, Ryan. <laughs> um, and one thing I did want to pluck out there um, to answer Jed's question in, in particular is um, that, oh no, sorry, not Jed's question, but the last thing that you said has been me personally. Um, one of the things I've noticed most is the sparring partner. Because the one thing that I think is very difficult for a singular human being to be 
is simultaneously like the critic and the the cheerleader of their own business and their own ideas. Where I think some of the most productive now, Pete, our CEO and I are not founders of Gus, but we made a significant decision years and years ago to step into bigger roles. And one of the cores of that is like I I can't have these conversations necessarily with myself and my own brain and stay sane. Like I need somebody to be devil's advocate. I need somebody like um, Alan said to look at you know like. Well, if we make this decision, we might lose a bunch of employees. Well, if we do this, we might do that. Just those conversations, I think, are kind of the lifeblood of corporate strategy, you know, especially at the smaller scale before you have bigger boards and lots of advisors and things like that. Uh, Gil, any last commentary before I pluck some more questions? Uh, yeah, well, so I would personally not start a company by myself either because I don't uh, my uh, of the 10 qualities, I don't have them all. My judgment isn't good enough. And so if it's just me, in an echo chamber, I'm going to make some bad decisions and have some things that aren't taken care of. So, you know, founders, it's like you can't live with them and you can't live without them. Um, you have to, a founder makes you justify the things you want to do because it's us, it's our company. So if I say, I'm, we're going to hire a new, you know, chief engineer, we're going to pay them $150,000 a year. And your co-founder says, whoa, 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 we're not ready for that. And you have to argue for it. You have, you have to, pass the ideas through. And so that, that process of having more than one head in the room is, is really critical um, for me. I, I do definitely agree that there are, uh, with Sam, that, that if you have enough support and you're a strong enough leader, uh, you can make that up uh, by having a great team behind you. Uh, great. So assuming we have a great team, uh, how do you settle things when there is conflict? You mentioned a little bit of the skill about you know, if it's 50-50, you know, it's not one vote over that, but a little bit more perspectives and experience with, um, is is there legal requirements and legal methods that you have to pursue to settle co-founder conflict? Um, or is it, how else does it happen? Um, I know Gil has an answer, but I'm going to give Alan and Sam a moment. Sam, it sounds like you've had a couple co-founder relationships where conflict ended them, even though the, the business was more or less successful. Certainly. Um, I would try to avoid the legal route at all possible. Once you go down that, you can't come back from it. So, you know, I, I would 100% avoid any initial reaction to uh, challenge or strife in the business through a legal channel. I'm a big believer in having a board of advisors around you, regardless of the size of your startup. It is smart to have experienced business owners or people in the industry you work in that you can count on that are on the outside that you can vet ideas through. And so one of the things that I think made us successful was, um, again, I come from a finance world. My co-founder came from Sapient Nitro, a tech marketing world, and we were building the combination of the two. It was smart for us to have a former head of Sapient Nitro as someone that we relied on. Uh, there was a head of a major bank as someone that we relied on, and there was a highly successful entrepreneur and venture capitalist in our backyard that we relied on, and he had experience in the fintech space. And so when there were challenges, we would often consult them and get input, and that input helped us get to a joint decision. Whereas had it just been the two of us going back and forth, we may have been trying to sell our position or convince the other to buy in. It was often um, neither of what we thought when we went to others and got input, and it helped us realign what we were thinking about trying to get past. And I, I can say that happened over and over and over again. We thought we were going down this path. We argued over it. We go to a team of experts, they brought in our thinking, and we were like, wow, what a waste of time. We need to go left instead of right, right? Let's zig instead of zag. It was extremely helpful for us. So I love having a team around you. I think I've shared that with you guys in many aspects, right? Whether it's the team around you from the you know CEO position, the team around you from a co-founder, or the team above you that's helping you get the job done. Find experts, ask them for help. They will not shy away if they are someone that wants to really see people succeed and add value. And I'm sure that on this call, there are a bunch of people that would be willing to give advice. Now, you don't always want all the advice, but find those people you can rely on that you can value and put them in your corner. Yeah, I think uh, Jed had a question earlier. Advisory boards are an overlooked area to get strategic advice without necessarily having to find that perfect co-founder. 
Um, and that's, you know, that's somebody if you talk to for handfuls of hours a month, who has deep experience, you know, also can have an equity grant much smaller than what a co-founder is because they're not in there in the trenches day to day, but they can really unlock uh, your startups potential and give you network access, future investor, you know, these people usually have broad networks, deep experience, uh, and they often love startups. Um, three Eleanor, year vesting schedule with a 3% for an advisory member, right? People give this away all the time. There's ways to get people in the door. All right, any, uh, Alan or Gil, do you want to comment on co-founder conflict? I saw a thumbs up from Gil about not resorting to legal means. Definitely avoid legal. Um, you know, one of the 10 traits of uh, qualifications of founder is flexibility. So people have to be willing and ready to change their mind and accept when they may not always have their way. There's a big difference between disagreement and conflict, by the way. You can have plenty of disagreements and resolve them, uh, and conflict and resolve it too. Uh, but, you know, sometimes it might be by saying, okay, you convinced me, but it could be, you know, I'm not going to win on this one, but I respect it. Uh, there are a lot of ways to achieve consensus, but ideally, uh, you know, the vote should be 100% to zero uh, because everyone kind of realizes the direction it's moving and, and agrees to go along. And if it becomes intractable because uh, you just can't align the vision or don't agree with it, uh, at some point it's time to split up. Uh, that inevitably often does get to legal, but hopefully it'll be a matter of just telling the lawyers to memorialize what you've decided that one of the founders is going to leave. Uh, but at some point, sometimes the, the conflict becomes, uh, you know, too much to reconcile. Hopefully not, but actually, you know, practically, uh, two founders, they might both survive. With three or four founders, I can guarantee you, one of them's going to be gone at some point before the others. It's almost inevitable. Um, Alan, and, I uh, believe that kind of happened. was your situation, right? Yeah, thanks for calling that out again. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, like life happens and and um, and so everyone goes, it depends on how long you're kind of in the game, but yeah, life happens and, and um, uh, sometimes there are things, you know, outside of um, like external forces that like, have somebody reposition their priorities and they're no longer there and that's okay. And so um, I think, you know, it, the legal side of it, I, I haven't had ex any experience on that um, when it comes to that, but everything Sam was saying, I was just nodding along because um, I have leaned heavily, not beyond being in kind of a founder role, but, you know, in a, in a role like I'm in now running like product and engineering at a, at a series B startup. I, uh, even when we were, five people in the room um, was immediately trying to find advisors for us because um, someone's got to call you out and tell you why you're wrong. And uh, you hopefully are surrounded by people who can do that fairly regularly, but it's very good to have others with deeper expertise or experience or a network you can rely on when you hit a situation where you want just another point of view. And the more of those you can find um, and bring in ad hoc, uh, the better. And so just build those over time. Um, and, and I think you'll, uh, in, in many parts of the business, but for me, I know that's been especially helpful. Great. All right. We got one more question. We're not going to be able to get to everything in the chat, um, but we'll do more of these. So please, it looks like we have great engagement and people are still here. So I'm going to let you all marinate on this one. Cause I'll ask you to set it at the end. So we have one more, uh, user question. And then just as a takeaway from talking with each other, um, to start thinking like your one most important takeaway, if you were somebody who does not have a co-founder and is trying to start a startup in as brief of ways you can, you know, if you could give just that kind of like top tip, uh, we'll get to that in just a couple of minutes. The question that we have is much more entertaining before that. Um, and somebody wanted to know about uh, husband and wife couples as co-founders. And I know Gil, you have a lot of experience with this. Um, why, why is it not recommended? You hear it kind of said uh, uh, here and there and whatnot, Our husband and wife married couples, um, and are there any examples of people bucking that trend and actually succeeding in that uh, configuration? Sure, there are. There, uh, didn't the um, founders of Cisco, was it? It's a husband-wife couple. And often one spouse starts the company and the other is there for support and is part of the company at some level. There are plenty more examples where it doesn't work out. Uh, uh, one of my clients, it's so sad, uh, there's a company called Six Apart, which was the big competition for WordPress. Uh, and many people thought it was going to be the successful company. 
And this couple came in and they were so good together. They named their company after their relationship. They were born six days apart. And that's why they called their company Six Apart. And, you know, they were working together so well. And then I learned later that they had divorced. It was just so sad. Um, and then the company ultimately didn't succeed. Um, let me tell you one reason why it's such a bad idea. Most companies fail. And by statistics, the majority, but a small, lower majority, but the majority of marriages also fail. And the problem is that one will drag the other down. A failing company can ruin a marriage. Even a successful company can ruin a marriage because you're working together in stressful situations that are different than the stressful situations you might have with love and romance and family and finances. Now you're running a company. Um, and so an investor looking at that will say, look, your company has a 90% chance of failure. This is from a very early stage. Um, but now you have a 95% chance of failure because sometime in the next five years, you're probably going to get divor divorced and you're going to hate each other and not work well together. So, so it's, it compounds the failure rate and, and it's just tying two things together that are really tough. And the reason why I said that friends start companies together and works really well is, well, you're not so afraid of losing your friend. It's not the end of the world. Um, and you may still, you may not be friends, but you may still be able to work together. Uh, and and if the company fails, you may or may not tank the friendship, but it's you're, you're okay to risk it. And then with siblings, you know, you're never going to lose your brother. They're always going to be your brother or sister, you know? So there's something about blood being thicker than water that that perseveres, and that's not always a threat. So that's kind of my, my takeaway. Um, there must be some good husband-wife teams, but there are a lot of horror stories, too. I do believe the the Cisco thing you brought up um, became the subject of a rather scathing um, uh, book uh, from Sandy Lerner uh, after the whole fact. But I think that might be way more than just the the foundations of Cisco. Didn't the board end up firing one of them, but not the other? Something like that. I I don't have the the total facts, but uh, I do know there's some some corporate intrigue and drama in and around that. Being asked to fire your spouse by the board is is uh, almost Shakespearean. <laughs> Uh, Sam or Ellen, any, any thoughts on that? I know I teed it up to Gil, who is exceptionally thorough in his experience, but if you guys have any experience. Separation yeah. of church and state, right? <laughs> I, when I was a young entrepreneur, I live and breathed everything I did. It stayed with me, it went home with me. I worked crazy hours. I was always doing it. And uh, my girlfriend at the time was overwhelmed by how vested I was in that. She's my wife today. We've, we've made it through this entire journey. We met in college um, and we have two amazing children and, and I have an amazing relationship with her. What I would not want to do is spend my entire life thinking about my project. And I would not, it want, would not want that to be encompassing of our life together and distract from the value we have as a family and as we have with our children. And so I love the fact that I can have her ingrained in what I'm doing, and I'm highly committed to my projects um, and my companies, my partners. Um, but I love being able to go home and have that relief and it not follow me. So personally, from my standpoint, I just like the separation and a little space. I think um, I'm going to slightly pivot this um, because Alan and I have spent um, many nights at the old Gus headquarters watching the sun go down in New York and replaced by stars and having conversations. And I know one of the things I've always uh, admired about Alan was the the relationship that you have with your spouse being a founder. Um, I'm not going to steal your thunder, Alan, but I know you have some, some pretty good perspective on that. Yeah, I think um, it, it, uh not all that different than what Sam said. I find myself agreeing a lot with you, Sam. But um, yeah, I mean, we we I, I used my spouse with very different industry. She's in she's in academia, um, but it's very helpful. Also, not just I, I think it helped from a, the perspective of of having the kind of dividing walls between the thing you're giving your energy to in the moment and the thing that you know um, when you can turn off, like you can truly turn off and um, you know have a a whole different part of your life that oftentimes I found myself um, 
uh, kind of getting recharged and, and needing that. I was that was necessary for me. But also, um, you know, my spouse uh, uh, was not in any way related to the kind of work I was doing or the industry I was in. And so I found a lot of things um, where I'd just be discussing uh, uh, kind of challenges I was working through on a more human level and and getting a different perspective that was outside of this very uh, tiny echo chamber in the New York City startup community I was in at the time where everyone seemed to have similar guidance and advice. And, um, and so I appreciated um, having a perspective that was just wildly different and coming from a different place. And so, um, yeah, I, I think, um, I think uh, for those reasons, um, I think I, I would never start a company with my wife, but we do lots of projects together. But it just gets a little messy when your livelihood is tied into that and you can't have an escape. Yeah. And also I would just say work style and lifestyle too. I think Alan and I used to talk about things and it'd get to like 8 PM or whatnot and not out of, you know, it's like, these are things you're interested in. It's like, Oh, wait a second. Well, it's like, no, like my spouse and I are like this, like this is, we, you know, we love and respect each other's space and boundaries. And it's not like working on your startup is also something causing, you know, friction at home, um, which can put pressures back on the startup as well. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for your generous extra time. Um, if we can swing this, uh, I'll start with you, Gil. Just kind of the top tip that you would give somebody when looking for a co-founder. I wish I could mute the other people so that you don't influence each other, but take it away, Gil. Okay. Well, like I said, uh, serendipity favors the prepared. So spend a lot of time ahead of time getting to know people and networking and having friends in the business world. Uh, so it's not an issue of finding a co-founder. It's an issue of two potential folk, two or more potential co-founders finding the time is right uh, to launch their passion project. Ah, that's a great one. Thank you, Joe. How about you, Sam? Don't be afraid of getting it wrong, right? You're, you're not always going to get it right the first time. Sometimes you do and you get lucky. That's great. It's like winning the lottery. But oftentimes you might go through a couple before you find the right fit. Don't get turned away from that. Embrace the excitement of what it means to build a relationship with someone. Really understand what motivates them, what drives them. And ultimately you will define and figure out if it's a right fit long term to do business with. Um, but don't put so much stress on yourself that you feel as if this is it. I have to get it right. Because like you said, a lot of marriages end in a divorce, a lot of relationships end up going sideways. And that's the same thing in business. No forced marriages. Take your time and don't be afraid to fail. Fantastic. Thank you, Sam. And how about you, Alan? Sorry to put you last. No, I think there's two things I think about. One is um, I, I mentioned the word obsession before, but find someone who is as obsessive about the problem that you're trying to solve as you are. Um, it matters because you're willing to do a range of different things to make that thing come to life. Um, but then the other the other side to that is to find someone you can be yourself with, um, who you can be vulnerable with. You they feel comfortably vulnerable with you. That's important because um, you're gonna like be in those moments where you need to actually be honest with one another. And it's a it's a heavy weight to carry if you're you're um, pretending to be someone you're not or trying to put on. Uh, put on a show and and um, uh, th those co-founders, especially um, when you have a lot of employees, are the people you can be yourself with and just let some of that let some of that out um, in a, in a way that feels safe. So uh, there, there's a yeah, I think there's a lot to just being very clear about who you can spend that time with and in a way that's truly unique to to, to you. Fantastic. So those are actually great top three points. Um, and I think we covered kind of the whole sphere in a bit of this conversation. So thank you all very much. Thank you for your extra time in addressing the Q&A. Um, this was a delight. Sam, it was great to finally meet you. Alan, nice to see you again. Yeah, I'll see you next week. Uh, but uh, be on the lookout for more events like this uh, as we continue our programming. Uh, like I said, we have events all over May and June, um, all about growing anything from the right insurance policies to get at the right time. So you're not either wasting money and or getting yourself in some serious jeopardy to early fundraising to uh, marketing validation growth. They're all over the place. Uh, there's a whole schedule we'll send out with a follow up on this. We'll also record it and then we'll send that out. We'll get that up on YouTube uh, within a couple of days. Um, but again, Alan, Sam, Gil, thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing your experiences, being open and vulnerable about, you know, some some of the, the biggest things that we uh, that are challenges in life and have a great week. Take care, everybody. Thank you, everybody.
Take care.